Amen. If you have children who want to go to children's church this morning, Miss Carrie is walking down the middle aisle right there. Miss Carrie, uh, would you stop and raise your hand so that parents can see you this morning? Miss Carrie is such a blessing to us, and she will take great care of your children. We want you to know that. If you have children to go to children's church, she is the lady to release them to. All right. Well... So glad to be here with you this morning. This will be our last sermon in the series, Response Time. And this morning, we're seeking forgiveness. So if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 6. That's what we'll be looking at today. You know, it's a reality for you and I. Often in our lives in relationship with one another, we hate the idea that we have offended someone in some way. And so many times what we do is if we know that we have offended someone, we'll go to them and we'll say, I apologize, I realize that I should not have said what I said, I realize that I should not have responded the way I responded, I realize that I should not have done what I did. And that's wonderful. The scripture tells us that if we expect to be forgiven by our Father who is in heaven, then we have to be willing to forgive one another. And so I always want to encourage you to be able to do that. But so many times what we fail to do is respond to God. When you and I know, when we understand, when we realize that we have wronged God, when we have gone against the law of God, so many times we fail to go to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus asking forgiveness. Friends, and I don't know if you understand this truth or not, but it is a fact that every single one of us in here are sinners separated from God without Jesus Christ as Savior. And so we are so thankful that Jesus is Lord of our lives, those who have confessed our sin and invited Jesus uh, to be our sweet, sweet Savior, our Redeemer. And as we just sang, how great our God is, friends, I want you to know there is not a thing that you have ever done in the past that is greater than our God's ability to forgive you of that wrong. And so this morning, we're going we're gonna to look at three truths that I pray that you see. I, I pray that, that you hold on to these things because these truths are important. It doesn't matter where you are in relationship to God, if you are a Christ follower and you have been for 70 years if you are a new Christ follower or if you are someone here this morning who has never invited Jesus to be Lord of your life this message this morning is something for every single one of you and my prayer is that you'll come to a place of recognition today and acknowledge whatever it is that confession would be made and you would respond to God this morning as he speaks to your heart so let me encourage you to stand in honor the reading of God's Word Psalm 51 Verses 1 through 6. And the scripture reads, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your love and kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Will you pray with me? Father, today as we take some time to... Uh, study a portion of your word, I pray right now in the magnificent name of Jesus that you would deal with each one of us individually as we need to be dealt with. Father, we understand that forgiveness is such a vital role in relationship with you. And I pray for those who have been Christ followers for many years that today, if if there is anything that would, would interfere in that relationship between them and you, that you would reveal that to them, that they would be willing to come forward and to confess that Jesus, you are able and willing to forgive any sin that we might have transgressed against you. And Father, I just thank you in advance that you are a loving, kind, compassionate, and forgiving God. Uh, And Lord, if there's even one person here today who has never trusted Jesus to be Lord of their lives, 
I pray that today they would receive the ultimate forgiveness by knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask it today in his holy name. Amen. So we're going to look at this section of Scripture this morning, and everyone, I believe, understands where we are. Most everyone understands where we are in Psalm 51. So this is David's plea to God that he would forgive him where he had transgressed. David had lusted after a woman first in, it, in his heart. That lust led to him committing adultery, but also that lust led him to having her husband killed. And so there was lust, there was adultery, there was murder, there was pride, there was selfishness, all involved in the reality of David's particular situation that he was dealing with, especially uh, as king of Israel. But what you'll notice in Psalm 51 this morning is David desired with everything that was in him that God would forgive him where he had transgressed against God and, and it's mapped out for you and I in a beautiful way and so there are three things very specific things that I want to share with you concerning you and I seeking forgiveness and the first thing that I'll sub submit to you is this we can rejoice that God is accessible to us even when we sin I want you to turn over on the back of your bulletin uh, turn over on the back of your bulletin and fill in those Blanks, so you'll just have a, a, an opportunity to follow along with this outline. We can rejoice that God is accessible to us even when we sin. I'm going to have to elaborate on that because I'm going to tell you this right now. I want you to understand this, church. Listen to me. Lost person, listen to me. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, listen to me. God will not hear a single one of our prayers if you and I do not acknowledge sin in our heart. That has to be understood up front. You must get to that place right now in your life in relationship to God and understand in order to be heard, in order to be forgiven your sin, you must confess first that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. How many of you understand that? Say amen. amen. If you are a Christ follower and you are thankful for the forgiveness of sin, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am so thankful that my Jesus is able to forgive me where I have wronged him so many times and, and able to go to my Savior often throughout the day and say, Father, I know that I've transgressed against your law. I know that I've transgressed against your word. I have sinned, whether it be lust in my heart, whether it be an evil thought towards someone else, whatever it might be, I'm so thankful that along the day I can go to my Heavenly Father and say, forgive me. I have sinned. I'm so thankful that I have an opportunity to do that, and I know, according to God's Word, He hears my cry. How many of you are thankful to know God hears our cries? We can rejoice that God is accessible to us even when we sin. Now, I want you to look at this scripture right here, verse 1 and 2. Listen to David's plea. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your love and kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Something I want you to get right here is this. David was craving to be cleansed by God. He had a heart desire of humility. He understood very well what was needed in his life especially when it comes to the relationship that he had between himself and his creator. He understood exactly the steps he needed to take, and he recognized that he needed to begin by confessing he was a sinner. He cried out. He pleaded for God to have mercy. And, and the reason he did that is because you need to understand that David was not a hardened rebel. He was not someone that intentionally over and over and over again transgressed the law of God or the word of God. He was not someone that came up with a plan. He devised a situation in his mind where he might go and sin against God. That was not David's plan. It was not that he was so rebellious against God that he shook his fist at God and he said, God, I sin against you. That was not his mentality at all. We better be careful of that because I, I want to tell you, I have seen people shake their fists at God. Have you ever been a witness to somebody lacking humility, very prideful, very self-centered? They shake their fist at God like God owes them something. 
That was not David's attitude in this at all. David really was very humble in this particular situation when he was confronted with his sin by Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 12. You can mark that down and you can look that up. But immediately he acknowledged his sin before God. That lets you know what kind of a heart God had. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in later scriptures we see that David was a man after God's own heart. The reason is because he was willing to confess when he had transgressed God's law, when he had sinned against God. That needs to be where you and I are as Christ followers because the scripture is quite clear in Psalm 66 verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, if I hold it dear, sin is what he's talking about. This is what the psalmist is referring to. If I hold this sin in my heart, if I enjoy this sin that's in my heart, he says, if I regard sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Friends, the same thing is, is true in the New Testament, John, where um, the blind man had been blind all of his life and they were in the, in the synagogue because the Pharisees really needed to hear from this guy the reason he was healed. What sin was it that called his blindness? And they tried to explain that this man had been blind all of his life. And this man finally goes on and he tells the Pharisees that we all know that God will not hear our prayers if sin is in our hearts. So it's said in the Old Testament, it's said in the New Testament. So you need to understand as a child of God, if you are harboring sin, if you're enjoying a season of sin, if you are living continually in sin, God will not listen to your request. But when you and I get to that place where we appeal to the nature of God, we can claim just as David did, we can rejoice that God is accessible to us even when we do sin. I praise God for that because I know that without the forgiveness of God, then I would be dead in my trespasses and sin, as all of us would. And so the scripture says, let's, let's make sure we understand this. This is what David was doing. He was appealing to the nature of God. He said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Can you picture the loving kindness of God? Can you picture the eternal love God has for you, a sinner? Can you picture the love God has? So much love that he was willing to send his one and only son to an old rugged cross to die on your behalf. I'm thankful that my Jesus died for my sin. I'm thankful to know that when I sin against God, I can declare, have mercy on me according to your love and kindness. That implies steadfast love. Eternal love. Tender mercies, it means that he pity or had compassion. And so David was literally asking for God's grace to prevail in that situation in his life. And I need you to understand wherever you are in relationship to God this morning, that God's grace will prevail if you are willing to humble yourself confessing your sin. It matters not where you are. If you are willing to humble yourself. If you are willing to fall on your face, if you are willing to get on your knees, if you are willing to open up your heart and say, God, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I have done this. I know that I have done that. Whatever it is, confess it. Name it. Claim it. You've done it. Cry it out to God. Say, Lord, I need forgiveness of this. And when you do that, this is what God, this is exactly what David was doing. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your love and kindness. According to the multitude of your mercies, blot out my transgression. This transgression, it speaks of his willful acts of rebellion against God. He knew what he was doing, even in the midst of him doing it. Yet he wasn't planning to do this. It wasn't something that he said, God, I'm fixing to sin against you. But in the act, he did know he was sinning against God. That was the reason his confession is so important. Blot out my transgressions. And then he cries out in verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. Wash me thoroughly. David asked God to blot out his sin. Literally what he asked him is that he would wipe away his sin debt. How many of us need to cry out right now and say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. You, you don't have to raise your hand. I, I just want you to think. I want you to internalize God speaking to you right now if he might be. Because I'm going to tell you something. I, I have to 
be careful. You know, I'm quick-tempered. I, I'm selfish. I'm prideful. So many things in my life could hinder my relationship to my Savior and my Creator if I'm not willing to seek God's forgiveness. So church, this morning, are you willing to cry out to God? If you're willing to cry out God, you can rejoice that God is acceptable, accessible to us even when we sin. That's number one. Number two is this. If you're following along, you fill in these blanks. We should never view sin lightly because all sin is against God. We should never view sin lightly because all sin is against God. So here we go. David is, is now literally acknowledged his guilt. He's deeply sensed that he is personally responsible for the wrong that, that he has invoked in, 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 in causing himself to sin. He did it all by himself. He didn't have to have help from anyone else. He was guilty of what he did. He confessed and it, the great thing is that with God, God agreed with him that he had sinned against him. But then he was also willing to forgive him of that sin. And it is the same thing as with you and I and as we look at this. And, and so here it is. God must be the standard for our actions. In this life, we must approach the Word of God, know what God says about this situation or that situation or this sin and that sin, and He must be our standard for the way you and I live our lives. He was for David. David understood that he had transgressed. He, he understood that, that he had fallen away. He understood that he had sinned against God. And so listen to what verses 3 and 4 says. I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. It, j just that he can't get the thought of how he had sinned against God out of his mind. It was there ever present before him. And the reason is because he was being convicted of his sin. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you know you'd sinned against God and God was burdening you because of that sin? Your chest hurt, your heart pounded, and you knew that you needed to confess to God and seek forgiveness. Have you ever been there? Am I the only one that's ever been there? Anybody else? Yes, exactly. And we get there and we understand that God is a loving, kind, compassionate, forgiving God. Well, David certainly understood that he had wronged others Bathsheba, Uriah, his family, his nation. Since all humans bear the image of God. But ultimately, what David did was wronged the Creator. That is his ultimate mistake. Let me give you an example of this. In the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 39, verse 9. How many of you remember Joshua and that time when he was in his master's house, Potiphar's wife decided that he, she really desired Joshua. I'm just going to go on and tell you. She wanted to bed him. She wanted him for herself. She didn't care what she had to do. And so she literally went to him and did everything she could to get Joshua's attention. And he continually, over and over again, he said, No, I will not sin against God. Or my master and so listen to what the scripture says in Genesis 39 verse 9 there's no one greater in this house than I this was Joshua acknowledging that he was the master he was the overseer of the house there's no one in this house greater than I nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God if you hear that say amen he knew that he was going to wrong the flesh he knew that he would wrong a human but ultimately he knew he acknowledged that his sin would be against God himself when God speaks and he pronounces guilt on the one who sinned he's completely righteous in doing so because it is against God alone that you and I sin because he is our creator. David explains this at some point in his life in Psalm 32 uh, verses 3 and 4. When he was living in sin, 
he was experiencing the judgment of God at one particular time. And this is what the scripture says, when I kept silent. He's talking about sin. When I tried to hide this sin. How many of you know you can never hide sin from God? Amen? You understand that? So he said, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. This is David acknowledging there was a season in his life where he had rebelled. There was this season in his life where he knew that he had sinned against God and he was experiencing the judgment of God upon him personally and his bones ached. He was in pain. It said that he was experiencing day and night the hand of God being heavy upon him. Oh my goodness, I can only imagine how dreadful that might be to know that the judgment of God is upon you. Friends, can I tell you a, a beautiful story? So that you could avoid that kind of judgment, God the Father sent His Son to die on an old rugged cross. So that you never have to experience the judgment of God. The full wrath of God will never be upon those who confess they are sinners and trust Jesus to be Lord of their lives. Thank you, Jesus, that I am set free from my past sin mistakes. Amen? I'm so thankful that I don't have to worry about standing at the throne of God one day at the great white throne judgment and Him proclaiming a sentence against me because I have sinned against Him. I'm so thankful that I am forgiven my sin and I'm so thankful that you are forgiven your sin. But understand this, when you sin, you sin against God alone. You wrong other individuals. Am I making this clear? You wrong other individuals. You wrong family, you wrong friends, you wrong co-workers, but you sin against God. And then the last thing that I want to submit to you this morning, church, found in verses 5 and 6, the holiness of God should quickly move us to confess sin in our lives. The holiness of God should quickly move us to confess sin in our lives. As David was confessing his act of sin, another truth struck him. Listen to what the scripture says. Look at verse 5. It says, behold, pay attention, look. That's what this means. Behold, pay attention, look. I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. But verse 5, we're going to get there first, because what he was doing is he was confessing that he was a sinner. He understood that he had sinned against God. We previously saw that in verses 3 and 4. So we know exactly where David is with God. And the question now becomes, do you know exactly where you are with God? In relationship to your Creator, this very moment, are you aware of where you are? And now, because you are aware of sin, are you aware of God's holiness as He chases you, as He runs for you, as he seeks you to confess your sin to him, our almighty God. And so, as we look at this, verse 5 and 6, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. I need you to understand something here. Brought forth in iniquity. He's not talking about the act of relationship between the husband and wife. That's not at all what he's referring to here. He meant that he had a sin nature from the moment he was conceived. That's exact truth for you and I this morning. Every single one of us, because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden thousands of years ago, five or six thousand years ago, because of that truth, because they transgressed the Word of God, they were told you can have any tree of the garden. Do not eat the tree in the midst of the garden. Do not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. Do not eat of the tree. All of these other 2,000 plus different kinds of fruit trees. You can have any of them that you want except this one tree in the midst of the garden. Now, there was one who was a deceiver who came in disguise. You understand that's exactly what he does today. He comes in disguise and he desires nothing more to get you off kilter in your relationship, in your walk with God. He wants you to trip up. He wants you to fall. It's wonderful as long as you are living your life for God a little. 
It's wonderful as long as you are lukewarm with one foot in the religious world and one foot in the real world. It's wonderful if you will live your life like that according to the devil's standards and desires for you. But that's not at all what God desires for you. That's not at all what God desires for me. And so I want you to understand this principle right here. The holiness of God should quickly move us to confess sin in our lives. The holiness of God. Our sin is not against one another. We wrong one another. I have shared that. Our sin is against God. And the scripture says, behold, I was brought forth in sin. He's trying to, to acknowledge. He, he was trying to, um, not trying to excuse his act. He was literally explaining in spite of his heart for God, he could still commit such a grievous sin. In Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 23, shares with us a section of scripture where we begin to understand even our own reality many times. Paul said this about sin. He says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells. This is true for all of us, by the way, church. I know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. Or in other words, I have a desire to do right. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. I have no idea how to make the right decision. Verse 19. For the good that I will to do or the good that I desire to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do or the, the evil that I don't desire to do, that's what I practice. That's what Paul said. Verse 20. Now if I do what I desire not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. How many of you understand that? Say amen. It's no longer I that does it, but sin that dwells in me in me I find then a law that evil is present with me the one who wills to do good for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members which is in my body in my flesh Always, there is a battle. Always, the reality of, of a righteousness that God desires from you or the struggle of temptation and sin. And we're always right here on the verge, always right here, one step away, one decision away, one choice away from entering past the temptation stage into sin. Please understand this, church. The temptation is not the sin. It's the very next step. So you have an opportunity with, within your reality. You have an opportunity within your situation. Satan is deceiving. He has masqueraded and he has blinded the reality of sin. You are in a moment of weakness and you need to cry out to God. That's the moment where you are weakest and that's the moment where you seek the greatest power. And that power is not found in you alone. It is found in the power of God through the presence of the Spirit of God in your life. You can be an overcomer. But you have to decide at this moment of temptation, I'm drawing a line in the sand. Satan, you will not tempt me. Satan, get behind me. Satan, you are defeated. You will not be victorious in my life. And you have to claim that. You have to tell Satan he has no control over you. You look Satan in the face, you look that temptation in the face, whatever it looks like, whatever beautiful package it comes to you in, it's still an opportunity for you to transgress the law of God. It's still an opportunity for you to sin against God. Here's the next thing. You have to know what your temptations are can't be good enough for me to know what your temptations are. can't be good enough for your family members to know what your temptations are. You personally must know what your temptations are, and you must understand if you plan properly, there will be a way of escape. God offers us that. 
No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful, and with that temptation, He will make a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God will make a way of escape. But you have to lean on Him. You do not have strength alone. How many of you understand that truth? Amen? Amen. So the last thing, the holiness of God should quickly move us to confess sin in our lives. And the last thing that I want to share with you in closing is this. This is our conclusion. God is gracious and offers cleansing and restoration for every single one of us. He offered that to David. This is the very reason that he wrote this song. He was crying out to God, have mercy on me. Oh God, according to your love and kindness, he was appealing to the nature of God according to your loving kindness and the multitude of your tender mercies. And listen to this. He said, blot out my transgressions. Why do you think the word transgressions is plural? Because there was a multitude of transgressions for David. Friends, do you understand that there are those, that same reality is set for you as well? There's a multitude of transgressions. There's a multitude of sins. We need God to, to be one who is willing to forgive not one of our sins, not two of our sins, but all of our sins. How many of you know that that is the very purpose Christ went to the cross? The perfect, spotless lamb. Blood was shed that your sin might be forgiven. If you would confess, if you would seek forgiveness from our Creator, He is a restoring God. Sin is horrible because it offends His holy person. But He will graciously accept and honor a broken and a contrite heart. But today, church, today, person who has never trusted Jesus to be Lord and, your, Lord and Savior, how many of you are willing to humble yourselves, seek God's face, cry out for forgiveness? It's response time. And I, I don't know exactly where you are, but what does restoration and forgiveness look like for you? What, what exactly is that? Once we confess it, then for you and I, for me as a sinner, it means that, that this restoration and forgiveness, it looks like being washed. Come home dirty from a hard day's work, you go straight to the shower, you, you get in that shower and it washes that filth off of you. That's what the blood of Jesus does. It accomplishes this, this washing, this cleansing, literally a purging. And what that means for you is that you are now forgiven, which leads to three things, fellowship, joy and service fellowship now with the creator joy because you know your sins are forgiven and service because you know he has called you out he has sanctified you he has set you apart from the rest of the world to live a life that is pleasing to him today how many of you would acknowledge you were a sinner in need of a savior today how many of you would acknowledge that it's time to seek God's forgiveness today church even for you how many of you would acknowledge that you had backslidden that you had walked away that you had turned your back how many of you today would be willing to say father in heaven forgive me where I failed you in the name of Jesus today you have an opportunity to turn back to God and know that he is a loving father waiting for you with his arms open wide we're gonna have a moment of prayer Troy you come and Miss Joan, Steve, you guys come and prepare to lead us in this invitation. But as we go to the Lord in prayer, I just want you to think, right now, wherever you are, ask God, Lord, has is, is there been a moment in my life this past week, this past month, this past year, where I've sinned against you and I have not confessed that? And if, if there's been a moment for you where you know you've sinned against God, then I want to ask you today, would you reach out to God? Would you open the old heart up and would you dial that number so that you can reach the throne of heaven and you can speak to God directly? You know, you have that opportunity. You have that opportunity where you can go to God personally and say, Lord, forgive me my sin. Today, church, maybe it's God is burdening you to come back. Run back to Him knowing trusting, believing that He is waiting with open arms. But maybe there's one of you here today. 
I don't know who you are, I don't know where you might be sitting, but maybe there's one of you here today who knows that if you were to leave this earth, if you were to die, you wouldn't go to heaven. Friends, we're going to have an opportunity today for you to respond. How do you make it to heaven, preacher? That's what I really want to know. Well, the Bible makes it clear. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God the Father has raised Jesus the Son from the dead, then you shall be saved. The Bible goes on to say, For all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, will you tell God that you need His Son, Jesus, to forgive you where you have failed Him? And would you invite Jesus? Would you receive Jesus? Would you believe on Jesus today? Would you have faith in Jesus today to be Lord of your life? Father in heaven, this morning, such a sweet reminder of the moments in our lives when we have walked away knowing that we've sinned against you. But Lord, in the midst of that sin, you are constantly beckoning, beckoning us as we saw with David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, as we saw with the great musician of the, of the Old Testament in Psalm 32 when he said that your hand was heavy upon him and that his bones felt brittle and his life felt weak. Father, I pray this morning if there's even one person here whose bones feel brittle with sin, the weight of sin, that they would understand today because of the death, burial, and the resurrection of King Jesus, they no longer have to carry that sin burden. Today, they can lay that down at your feet. They can enter into a yoke with you because your burden is light. Father, I pray wherever they are, among this room or in the sound of our voice, those even watching on Facebook, that today would be a life-changing day for those who would confess their need for forgiveness. Father, we seek it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, would you stand this morning? You stand. The altar is open. If you need to make a decision, whatever it is, you come this morning.